Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the TheWealthyHomeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. And thanks for having me back, Jim. Ross, is it really true the color choice of your house could make a difference in how much value you get from it if you sell it? Could the color choice in the house make a, a difference when you sell? In other words, could you paint? Could you? This is this is the. Uh, the well, that's what Zillow the, in the U.S. is saying. Yeah, yeah, that's the Zillow survey. Yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. So, so this this is that this really puts everything into perspective. Of what we talk about on this show every week, Jim. Uh, what you have here in the United States is a nine billion dollar company called Zillow, and they they are a real estate website. That's all that they are. They're just a real estate website. They're always searching of ways to justify eyeballs going to their website. They're not happy with just the houses like we have in Canada on Realtor.ca. They're look, they need to have a, a bigger narrative, a bigger story. So they always come up with these crazy ideas. This is the same company who will pay my firm a million dollars, a million dollars, if we give them how we forecast housing prices. In other words, they have a prize in the United States called the Zillow Prize, which is a million dollars, which is open to ev- anybody who wants to participate that is able that, uh, to help them create an algorithm to improve their ability to forecast prices. Now, since our algorithms are 100% accurate, all we would have to do is tell them how simple ours are, and they could implement it, and they could have a 100% house price um, algorithm. But we would never do that for a million dollars because these folks are people who take advantage of other people. What I mean to say by that, Jim, is that when we're forecasting house prices for someone who uh, is, is using our service to buy a house, if we know housing prices are going to drop $50,000, it would be unethical for us to tell the, that young family to go out and buy a house knowing a year from now that house is going to be worth $50,000 less. We have no skin in the game. We are not being paid by giving someone advice to go out and buy a house. The same thing has happened in Vancouver. So in the, in the, tw- in the fall of 2015, when we saw housing prices, the housing market was contracting in, in Vancouver, and we know that the market was going to roll over in the spring of 2016, we had people who were asking us, begging us, to give them the advice that they could go out and buy a single detached home in, in, the, in Vancouver. Some people were looking at over 4 to $5 million to spend. And they were, they were constantly at us for us to give them the go-ahead to buy. Where our housing metrics said, no, 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 the housing market is already contracting. It's going to be able to be getting correcting in the, the early months of 2016. And here we are, years later, and those th- that has been proven true. Some of those people are up a million dollars by waiting. They're still waiting right now. And um, you also have a group of people who are still believing the foreign buyer tax was the reason your housing market uh, turned negative, even though housing prices were already negative uh, two months before the tax was even being announced. And that goes back to this question with Zillow with changing the color of a the color affects price that is a myth folks I can tell your listeners that there is a what there was a house here when I was selling houses in the early 1990s it was in a new subdivision it was a, a newer home it was a beautiful little house and it went through two real estate brokerages had the property for sale and they could not sell the property in the meantime, while this house is for sale, we had already sold a couple of houses on the street and a couple of houses 
a couple of streets over. The people could see that our houses were selling and the, their brokerages couldn't sell their house. They called us up and the second we picked up the, the phone and they gave me the address, I know what house, I knew what house they were talking about because I knew why their house didn't, hadn't sold. They thought that we were going to tell them that we were, they were going to have to reduce their price to sell the property. We said, no, 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 you don't have to reduce the price. But before we will take your listing, we, you have to agree to do one thing. And as long as you agree to do this one thing, we will list your house, and actually we will raise it higher than what the last brokerage had it listed for sale. This is in a correcting housing market, Jim. They were flabbergasted ask, asking us what we wanted them to do. We told them they had to paint their garage door beige, instead of teal green. They couldn't believe that we said that we wanted them to change their beautiful garage door that both the previous brokers had told them was beautiful. We told them to paint it beige. We had the property listed for four days and it sold. It sold for full money in a correcting housing market. Now, did that color change get those people more money for their house? No. What it did was it allowed their house to sell. It removed a hurdle from the buyer. What Zillow has come out is, and, and said is they are saying, if you paint your front door black in the United States of America, your house is going to return $6,000 more average selling price by painting your front door, your entry door black. What our housing intelligence tells us, the reason why our algorithms work and Zillow's don't, a $9 billion company in the United States can't do what my little firm does is because we understand through our data set that the houses with black doors are disproportionately more expensive homes. The houses with black doors are disproportionately red brick, white trim homes. The houses with black front doors disproportionately are in more expensive neighborhoods. As a result, a house with a black door just happens to be, generally speaking, a higher quality house than a house with a white door or a red door. Zillow goes on to say that if you paint your outside of your house bright yellow, your house will not be worth Go, will not you will not get as much for your home if you paint it buttery yellow. Again, it's because they use flawed. They can they can't read the data properly. If they could read the data properly, what they would understand is, generally speaking, these bright, vibrant yellow houses are in older communities where the housing prices are generally lower. The buttery yellow houses are in newer subdivisions or their newer homes where housing prices are higher. So the average selling price of butter colored doors, exteriors, is higher than bright yellow colored doors. One only needs to look at a fishing community on the East Coast to understand what I'm talking about. Vancouver, or excuse me, Newfoundland has beautiful yellow houses that you see in pictures, bright blue, bright green, bright red. You don't see butter yellow there. You may see butter yellow in Alberta where someone's had a stucco home and they're not ready to go to beige. They go to that buttery yellow color because it's been in trend. So what Zillow is telling everyone in this report and what, what your listeners can take from this report is a $9 billion company in the United States of America called Zillow, which will soon be listing uh, Canadian properties, advertising Canadian properties on it, doesn't understand the data that it has. The reason why it will pay us a million dollars for our house price forecast algorithm is because they don't know how to read the data in order to make the algorithm work. They don't understand the most basic, basic basics of real estate. 
the fact that a home buyer seeing a beautiful home with a teal door is not going to spend $6,000 more if you paint it beige. They're just going to buy the house and pay what you were asking for it in the first place. If you leave it teal, they're simply not going to go anywhere else but your front driveway as they drive by. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross Kate. Ross Kennedy Stewart, who won the election in Vancouver for mayor, and after we tape the show, we'll know who will lead the country's biggest city, Toronto. A listener was asking if efforts to lower prices in big c- cities will cause changes for the rest of the province. Well, that's, and, a good, that's, a good, that's a good question. And, and Ross, my big question is, can they make changes to affect prices? Okay, so if I'm not mistaken, in I'll, I'll stick with with Vancouver right now because with Toronto, I'm assuming it's going to be Tory gets reelected, uh, and if it's Keys Matt, I mean she's a city planner; she doesn't know what the heck she's talking about. None of them do. Um, Kennedy Stewart, I believe, if I, when I looked at his looked at his uh, stats, he, he has an economics degree, possibly a, a PhD in economics. So there may be an opportunity for someone to sit down with Mr. Stewart and educate him on how housing markets work. If that takes place, there is a possibility for um, to resolve the problem that you have with housing affordability in Vancouver. But the, the, the residents of Vancouver are going to have to accept the same reality the residents of Toronto have to accept. And that is your city and the lands around your city, the neighboring cities, are going to have to be allowed to grow. You are going to have to start building more housing stock at a quick enough rate that home buyers choose brand new homes versus resale homes. When the builders are building enough homes, that where the consumer stops looking at the resale market, housing prices decline, housing prices drop. The value of land decreases. It's, it is it is a uh, chicken in the egg discussion, Jim, because as land prices drop, builders can drop the price for what they're selling their houses for even further, which further adds to affordability. So what Mr. Kennedy, uh, Stuart Kennedy is, or Kennedy Stewart, excuse me, is faced with is he is faced with the daunting task of wading through decades and decades and decades of seller beneficial housing market intelligence. Housing intelligence designed for the sole purpose of getting the highest price possible in the shortest period of time. And for him to come up with a solution to how to, how to make houses affordable. Now, I'll give, I'll give, uh, Mr. Stewart some free advice here if he happens to listen to your show. And any of the listeners who know him, I'm going to encourage you to get Mr. Stewart to listen to this uh, show and, uh, and listen to Jim and I here. When I look at a municipality, when we are trying to decide how we could improve affordability, the very first thing we look for, Jim, are closing schools. That is the very first red flag that we see in a community. A school 
that is closing because enrollment is dropping. What our advice to any politician in a major urban city would be is you'll, you need to understand that your land, your building envelopes, your land in any community needs to be rolled over. It needs to be turned over. It needs to allow new families to move in. The moment that the forecasted enrollment rates, forecasted, don't wait till it happens. Go ahead and do it before, before just when the forecast shows that there's not going to be enough children in a local neighborhood to keep that school humming at the pace it's been humming, you need to lower your zoning regulations in that community. You need to designate certain types of building lots for intensification. You, you, you need to allow densification to take place anywhere declining student enrollment takes place or is forecast to take place. Because what you do, Jim, is over a 10-year window, which you generally can forecast these, uh, these school enrollment declines by 10 years, that gives the, the builder community the ability to go back into these older communities and change the housing stock. You can pick corner lots for the sake of the argument, Jim. If there is a single detached home on the corner where two streets intersect, you can designate all corner lots to be densified. You can say, where previously we had a single detached home here, we're going to approve semi-detached. We are going to approve those semi-detaches contingent upon a home to land value ratio of uh, 66% building, uh, uh, 34% land. We are going to hold the building envelope permits, the building permit, permit given for that land to a certain price. In other words, we are going to only approve permits to build a home that is $700,000. That allows young families to sell their condo or their townhome and move into these older neighborhoods where their children who are entering school or now in school can start filling up these schools. The worst problem that these politicians have is that there has not been a historical study done on how city uh, families evolve, grow, and move through the housing stock. The reason why we're able to forecast house price changes, the reason we're able to forecast where your provinces go, the reason why we knew 2016, if, if someone asked us, Jim, 10 years ago, where, wh where in 2016 was peak house price growth going to be recorded, we would have said it, we would, it would have been in British Columbia. And then they said 2017, we would have said Ontario. We would have said that 10 years ago. Now, I'm not saying 10 years ago that those forecasts would have been as precisely uh, accurate in hindsight as, as we would have made them, because we would have made those forecasts based on our understanding of how families work up the property ladder, how that property ladder creates an imbalance of supply and demand, and when that imbalance reaches a critical point. In British Columbia, it would have been 2016. In um, in Ontario, it would have been 2017. It's a coincidence that those two markets peaked at those two times. We would never say that we're going to be that kind of accurate in terms of a forecasting for an entire province. Um, we we would we could not promise that 10 years from now peak house price growth is going to hit no more than we can promise 10 years from now the housing correction will have bottomed and the market will, will begin changing. The reason we can't say that is is because we have to look at interest rates, we have to look at uh, income taxes, we have to look at um, tax rebate programs, grants, land property tax, changes to CMHC, changes to, to the OSFI, changes to uh, local zoning changes, uh, changing changes to um, how long people are are in uh, second um, post secondary education before they start their families. 
how much household debt they're taking. All of those things can change over that 10-year window, Jim, and that may have altered our, our forecasts for when that peak supply and demand pressure would have hit. Mr. Kennedy doesn't know a single thing what I'm talking about. Yet I think to your listeners, oh, if what he's saying is true, is true, that makes common sense. The same thing for the city of Toronto. Someone coming out and promising residents they're going to build 100,000 affordable housing units without having a plan. You can't do that. We could say how you can build 100,000 affordable housing units in the most economical way possible and what the cost is going to be. In In order to do that, politicians would have to enact rules and regulations that meet the the, the uh, requirements to hit our forecast and our target. If they don't, if they didn't implement those rules and regulations, those forecasts would never be reached. It is the whole package that has to be looked at, and that's what this question goes back to: Will changes to Vancouver's housing market, which we call the home sell, the home trading infrastructure, impact the rest of the province? The simple answer is yes. It will affect the rest of the provincial market in the same way that the ridiculously low property taxes, single-family detached homes in Vancouver pay compared to Kelowna or Langley impact housing prices in the rest of the province. This is simply reality. There are dozens of levers that are, that can be pulled that change how the home trading infrastructure works. The reason why we can forecast change two years in advance is because you can pull that lever today. It's going to have a consequence two years from now. We have that, that, that much of a lead time. Ten years, no, because more levers can be pulled, changing the course of of the market over that period of time. Two years, yeah, we pretty much always know what's going to happen. One year, yeah, guaranteed, we know what's going to happen. So that's what the the listener who poses question, uh, I hope they can take from this answer, is that any change that takes place in Vancouver or Toronto, for that matter, will have a consequence across the rest of the province, regardless of what you're told anywhere else. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, President of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross Kay. A listener asks, how does paying $1,000 your, to your bank for your mortgage pay- payment increases one's wealth by 2000 bucks?" Well, I can tell your listener this is relating to the question from last week. I'm, I'm assuming the, our, our discussion last week, and I can tell you that we have we have some some uh, members uh, in the, the wealthy homeowner program who who paid their bank a thousand dollars, and the bank gave them back five in the last uh, in the last eighteen months. Five thousand. Yeah, you gave them a thousand, and as you're walking out the door, they gave you five. And everybody says to me. Housing affordability. They talk about housing, the cost of housing. And we say to them, you don't understand or you're not looking at it the way that we look at it. I, I mean, you gotta, I've gotta be careful when I say you don't understand because that implies, um, you know, that, uh, 
something to the negative. What I'm saying is you've never been explained home ownership math the way that it works. So right now in Canada, the average Canadian for every $1,000 that they pay to their bank, the bank is already giving them back about $480. So if you make a $1,000 mortgage payment, $480 is that is principal. So you're paying about, uh, what's that, $520 in interest, and you're paying yourself $480. It's the reason why we, we call a home, um, you're paying yourself. You are the landlord and the tenant at the same time. As, as the, and as the tenant in a house that you own, you are paying the landlord's mortgage off for them. That's exactly what's going on. Um, you're, then we, we, we look at the overall, the overall house. So what happens if it is a $100,000 house and that $100,000 house goes up 12% in a year? Well, that would mean that $100,000 house is increased, increased in value by basically $1,000 in the month. We can talk about how it's staggered over the 12 months, but just to make it easy, we'll say it's $12,000. It goes up 1000 a month. Now, if you're paying uh, a $400 mortgage, which is about $438, I think, is what, what you're paying in terms of uh, average going rates on a uh, high-ratio mortgage on a $100,000 purchase, um, you're getting $1,000 in, in increase in value, a thousand dollars back, and the four hundred of the four hundred and thirty dollars, four hundred and twenty-eight dollars you paid in your mortgage, you're getting about two hundred dollars. Two hundred of that was principal. So now you've got two hundred plus a thousand is a twelve hundred dollar gain, twelve hundred dollar gain on the four hundred and twenty-eight dollar monthly payment that you make. You're getting three almost three times your money back. This is what people, when we hear academics talking about affordability, house prices, the housing market, the cost of homes, the cost of shelter, subsidized, when we hear all of these things, when they talk about housing affordability, they have no understanding, Jim, that in 1990, you gave the bank $2,000, $2,000, and the bank gave you back about fifty. Today, if you give the bank $2,000 as a homeowner, well, certainly in, uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2017, if you're a condo owner in, uh, in uh, Vancouver, the bank would have handed you back three, 3000 So when people want to compare what baby boomers earned on the money that they paid in their house versus what today's millennial would have earned in 2017 on a house, it's a joke. The return on your investment or your return on your monthly payment is tremendously better. It is like a dream how awesome it has been the last five years for home buyers. And going forward, it's still going to be awesome. Even as housing prices correct, it's it's better than what people face in the 1990s. Well, certainly in Ontario here. I mean, I have to look at the provincial numbers for each for each province when I'm talking province-wide. But this is what we have to understand when we're talking about housing. There is a Genuine misunderstanding between expense and cost. It is, it is two totally different things. There is a misunderstanding about the price of houses and housing affordability. There's a misunderstanding about affordable housing and subsidized housing. There is a total misunderstanding in the uh, rent-to-own relationship, the, 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 how the numbers work. There are well-known, popular uh, financial advice columnists, uh, uh, financial advice authors, 
out there today who have on YouTube price and ownership and uh, rental comparisons, where we watch their uh, their productions, Jim, and, and we just shake our head. What are these people talking about? If I'm going to give my bank a thousand dollars and they're going to give me back two, I just made a hundred percent on my investment. In 1990, I lost 90 percent of that invested dollar. I didn't get a 100 percent increase in this in the, the same day that money went into the bank we need to step back and the young people our next generation of home buyers they are going to navigate the property ladder in a totally different way than their parents did they are going to have to it's not necessarily worse it's not necessarily better it is different a housing market correction is going to take care of the entry-level prices for real estate. And I I hope all of your listeners can trust me with that. A housing market correction always corrects the entry-level price for young buyers to get into the property ladder. You may need to take another step or two over the course of your lifetime of home ownership, and, and I really don't want you to take those steps because I know how financial damaging each additional step you take is to, to your life. But if that's reality, that's reality. The truth of the matter is you can give, you had an opportunity to give your bank $1,000 in the same month you were getting $2,000 back. Home buyers in the 1990s, Gave $2,000 and got 50 bucks back. There is no comparison. Then again, they were lucky enough to get house price gain at the end of their life cycle instead of the beginning of it. Anyone who talks to a financial advisor only has to ask that question. If, is it better for my investment lifetime? getting ready for retirement, to have higher gains early in my investment or later at the end, just before I'm ready to retire. And you're going to find every single financial advisor in the world with a brain in their shoulders is going to say those early returns set you up for failure or they set you up for success. If you have owned a house over the last five years, you were set up for success, regardless of the cost of entry into the market. Ross, today we learned new home investment fell in August for the first time since May of 2014. You began warning about that over a year ago. How come your forecasts are so accurate? So the housing investment, new investment that stats can measures, Okay, that is a latent measure of the housing market. Really, really, really late. It, it, it's as as we said in the show. This was a forecast we gave in this show about two years ago, when everybody was saying how the housing market was fueling the economy. We 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 came on the show and we said, wait a second, the housing market is already slowing down. That means uh, two years from now you're going to see the investment in the new home sector start to fall which is exactly what you saw today. The same way back in uh, StatsCam was commenting, this was the first time since May of 2014. First time since May of 2014 when the uh, new housing construction investment declined. Well, we gave the same forecast back in uh, May, May of 2013 that meant new housing construction was going to increase beginning a year later which is exactly what happened. What your listeners can take from this one careful point, uh, Jim, before we end the show today, that forecast that we made in May of 2013, that peak house price was reached, has been proven 100% true now five years later. And right now your listeners are saying, 
what the heck is this guy talking about? Housing prices have skyrocketed since 2013. What I'll tell you is, well, not really. What has happened is, gradually, each month, the sales mix has shifted. And it shifted consistently while housing prices were increasing. That shift, those rising prices were caused by the shift. Each month, as the sales mix shifted, house price illusion was created by every single house price metric in Canada. Housing prices have increased 1% in June. Housing prices have increased 2% in July. Housing prices have increased 10% year over year. All house price change that takes place in a trading cycle is compositional based. When you're measuring home buyers, you understand that that's what's going on. If there are fewer first time buyers buying, it means your housing prices are going to go up more that month. And since housing markets are linear, in other words, the forecast that you make is, is almost on a straight line, you just don't ever get housing stats that are presented to you on a straight line the way that we, the way that we interpret them. You would have known when we made the call in May of 2013 where we said peak house price gain had been reached, we were referring to the maximum purchase price of first-time buyers. The threshold purchase price by first-time buyers had been met. Once that price was met, that meant from that day forward, as a percentage of the total sales, first-time buyer shares of sales was going to decrease. When first-time buyer shares of sales decreases, that means you t it takes more steps in the property ladder to make the full the full uh, sales chain work. In other words, first-time buyer buys a first-time house. The owner of that first-time house buys a second-time house. The owner of that second-time house buys a third-time house. The owner of that third-time house buys a fourth-time house. Somewhere along the line, if the builders are building the right housing stock, the person exits the existing home market and moves into the new home market. Historically in Canada, that has happened for the last 40 years. It was only recently when the, not the share of new homes being built that were single detached where that started to shift. The reason why you have falling new home construction is a result of the resale housing market two years ago, not today. National. This is a national number. Okay, so that means the year later in 2017 when the Ontario housing market was being reported with 30% house price gains, that market was already, was already contracting. The new home sales hit a year later. Same thing happens with on the upswing. We don't just, when we release a stats, Jim, or we're talking here on the show, our firm does not just look at exist, the existing home market. We look at all components of the housing market, existing homes, new homes, the tenancy market, the subsidized market, the, the um, vacation home market. We have to look at all of those. If we, if we weren't looking at those, we never would have understood that foreign buyers were impact, were removing housing stock from Vancouver. The only reason we knew that is because our mortgage data didn't line up any longer. The only reason our mortgage data doesn't line up with our market data is because new players are entering the market, players that are non-Canadian. That is the only reason it happened. These numbers all work together to form a puzzle. That puzzle is really easily put together if you've done the puzzle over and over and over again. It's the same puzzle. That is why our forecasts are so accurate. We can use our metrics and go back and test 40 years of housing data to see if our outcomes were the same. There is no way that I would come on this show, Jim, week after week, giving housing market intelligence, 
recommendation. There is no way I would supply Ross K Realty Consultants housing metrics to the wealthy homeowner platform for innocent young families to make a lifetime decision if those if those housing market uh, metrics and forecasts were not going to be 100% accurate. I it's just not who I am. I just wouldn't do it. My name in my community would be destroyed. This year alone, I'm coaching 25 kids and their families. I've done the coaching deal now for over 20 years. That is literally thousands of families, the kids I've coached. Do you think I would destroy my reputation by coming on here and giving false advice that I don't get paid for? If I wanted to give false advice, I would have kept selling real estate. I would have sold real estate and kept my mouth shut, as I was required to do by law. Keep your mouth shut. Sell houses. The only way you're going to make any money is if you convince an innocent young couple to buy a house that you have listed or one that you want to sell. That is the only way that you can make money. Now, that meant from 1990 till 1998, eight years in Ontario, real estate agents were forced to lie to the public. The only way around it was to structure your client purchase uh, decisions, home ownership situations, in a way that you could still make them break even. So that's what my family was committed to for eight years, simply working on strategies so that when someone was buying a house from us, they weren't going to lo lose any money. That's what our entire strategy was built on. So when I'm talking here about May of 2014 or I'm talking about August of 2018 housing data on StatsCan that says sales are declining, when in the show two years ago we warned of that, it's because it's not brain surgery. This is how housing markets work. They work the same way every time. And I appreciate the guys in House Street for letting me come on this show. Ross, well, thank you very much for being on the show. Well, it's because of you, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross or the show, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.